Goedemorgen. Welkom bij deze workshop van het Pensioenpro Jaarcongres. Mijn naam is Maarten van Wijk, ik ben editor online van Pensioenpro. En ik zal deze sessie voor u begeleiden. Um, het was schrikken deze maand uh, toen we het inflatiecijfer hoorden voor de maand oktober. Het was 5,6 procent en dat was getallen die we eigenlijk sinds het begin van de jaren 80 uh, niet meer hebben gehoord. Ik heb het zelf niet eens uh, leef, meegemaakt. Um, en, nou ja, en tegelijkertijd in, in die tijd was de rente ook hoog. Nu is die laag. Dus het zijn bijzondere omstandigheden. En uh, de vraag is ook of dit nou een tijdelijk fenomeen is. Of dat het misschien toch langer bij ons blijft. En misschien belanden we ooit wel weer in wijmerachtige toestanden. Dat zijn periodes die we gelukkig allemaal niet hebben meegemaakt. Maar um, je hoopt dat dat ook niet gaat komen. Nou, iemand die ons daar zaken over kan vertellen. Hoe we daarmee om moeten gaan. Hoe we ons daarop moeten voorbereiden. Is uh, Guillermo Felices van uh, PGM Fixed Income. Hij is daar investment strategist. Welkom Guillermo. Thank you very much. My pleasure. <laughs> I just um, in, talked a little bit about inflation. Uh, maybe you heard the word Weimar come up there. Um, <laughs> otherwise, it's been in Dutch. Um, we um, have a workshop here. I think we have about 45 minutes. Uh, you're going to have a talk uh, on inflation and how to deal with it for about 20 minutes. Then we have uh, 25. Then we have uh, plenty of time for questions and answers. Um, we have a live audience here. It's somewhat smaller than normally because it's a hybrid conference and we have a large audience at home as well uh, through the um, um, online. Um, I would like to encourage everybody, uh, the people in the room as well as the people uh, that are watching from home, uh, you can ask your questions um, through the chat box which is, uh, which is in your screen and as I understand Guillermo you're also happy to be uh, interrupted during your presentation for questions as well because this is supposed to be an interactive okay. session. All right, so um, off we go. Um, we're happy to listen to your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to be um, here with you, um, albeit uh, virtually. Um, I'm a big fan of the Netherlands. I've been traveling for business for the last 15 years or so, and I can tell you it's one of my favorite places to, um, to work. Um, I, um, I really enjoyed the discussions uh, with, with clients over the years. And I have a fantastic topic to discuss with you. So I, I really, really uh, wanted to, you know, to make this as, as interactive as possible. Um, so to have you know, questions and debates, uh, because they will help me and they will help you as well. Uh, it's a key topic. So the topic is you know, the shortage economy and uh, whether this is you know, permanent or temporary. And, and then I will elaborate also on what are the, the policy implications, of course, the inflation implications of the shortage economy, then the policy implications and then the market implications of this. So, so let's, uh, let's get on with it. And um, hopefully you can, you can see my agenda in the, in the, first, uh, in the first slide. So if you can please help me um, move the slides forward. Great, thank you. So I will start with a, with a quick motivation um, for why this is so important. I think this is, a, as I said, a, a truly, truly central topic for any investor. And then I will tackle three areas of shortages that I think are really important for the inflation outlook. The first one is in manufacturing, so the shortages that we're seeing in the, in the manufacturing uh, goods sector. The second will be about the labor markets, and the third will be about commodities. And then I will bring it all together and we'll discuss you know, the inflation implications, the policy implications, and the market implications. So let's move on to the next slide, please. And I remind you, please feel free to interrupt me anytime. And uh, I'm very happy to take questions. And, um, and that way, you know, we, we make it also more interactive. So first thing to note is that, you know, these three areas of, uh, of shortages are hugely important for, you know, whatever, you know, view we form on inflation, on policy and therefore on duration and risky assets. So as I said, I'm only touching on three, which I think are particularly crucial at the moment, but there's, there's plenty of others. But this is, is really, really important to form you know, any view on, on duration, if you're thinking about fixed income, and then of course, on risky assets more generally and on spread products or you know, the risky part of, of the fixed income universe. So next slide, please. And I will start um, by basically showing you some metrics 
that give us a sense of you know how much disruption we're seeing in some of, of these markets. I will start with manufacturing. So we know that you know there's shortages in various you know in various good sectors in shipping in Asia uh, and, and it's usually you know hard to you know have you know clear indicators for how much distortions we're facing. So I here I have two basically one is just looking at the you know the typical PMI report and focusing on uh, what we call the slower um, the 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 supplier delivery times. So essentially, it's a part of the PMI report that gauges, you know, how fast deliveries are getting um, are getting out and hitting, you know, the customers. So that's on the left hand side. So basically, the further down we go, the slower the delivery times. And you can see this for the US and uh, for the global economy. And in both cases, essentially, we are at the lowest levels. Um, since you know, since since the start of the sample in, in 1998, so that is to say, essentially, deliveries are very very slow. And typically, we think of this as oh, there's a supply issue. Suppliers, you know, cannot get their stuff delivered, and it must be the case that it's actually you know a supply problem. So what I will try to show you is that this is not just a supply problem, but also a, a demand problem. We can also see this on on inflation. So on the on the right hand side, we're seeing a very unusual phenomenon, in, at least in the last you know thirty years or so, which is the fact that goods inflation is actually going up quite rapidly in the U.S., in developed economies, and also in emerging markets. And I just want to flag you know the second bullet point there because I think it's really interesting. I don't know if you remember, but Chairman Greenspan, so several decades ago. And was really into statistics, and he and he basically looked at these supplier delivery times as a gauge for inflation. So we found this article from the Wall Street Journal that literally says, "Want to know how the Federal Reserve Chairman tells if inflation is going to get worse? Forget all those government numbers. Just look to see if it's taking longer for manufacturers to get supplies delivered." So again, it's just to show that you know this indicator is particularly important for gauging inflationary pressures. So next slide, please. So essentially, me and my colleagues at Pigeon um, have tried to disentangle what we think is, you know, supply-driven and what is demand-driven out of, you know, the shortages in manufacturing. And uh, and the first approach we take is to look at, you know, the PMI report, and we basically pick two time series: so the global manufacturing output and delivery times. So delivery times is this time series that I showed before. We also look at uh, global manufacturing output, which is usually associated with with demand. And essentially, what we try to do is we try to back out using econometric techniques and, in particular, a vector autoregression model. What part of you know of of the current shock is actually demand, and what part is supply? So, to give you a feel for what we do, essentially, what we're trying to explain here is that even though you know, manufacturing output, for example, is associated with the demand side of the economy. It could also be affected by supply shocks. So if, you know, if, if, if supply chains get completely broken, of course, that will slow delivery times and that will reduce output, right? So, so it's, 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 you know, it's an interplay here of two forces. Conversely, if you see slower delivery times, you know, these are usually associated with supply shocks. But they can also be affected by the state of demand. So if you have much stronger demand, typically you see higher utilization of, of resources, and that tends to slow deliveries. This is more the, the channel that German Greenspan were, was referring to us as the economy heats up because of high demand. You know, those deliveries also you know, tend to slow down. So it's just to show that, you know, basically there's two elements here that are, you know, combined into those these two time series. But with the econometric techniques that we use, we can actually you know, try to break them down. And in, in my next slide, what I actually show is that it's essentially an estimate of how much you know, of the change that we've seen in supply delivery times and in output is demand-driven and what is supply-driven. So the chart on the left basically tells us what has happened since the pandemic began, so basically since, say, this December 2019 until now, both in terms of supply delivery time, which is the first column, 
and the, the output part of the PMI. So the, the little dot tells us you know, how much the, the, time, the time series has moved. And then the, the bars tell us the decomposition into supply, which is the yellow one, and demand, which is the light blue one. So since the pandemic began, basically supply delivery times have been mostly driven by supply. So basically 75% or so of that movement is driven by supply. 25% has been driven by demand. In the case of output, it's kind of half and half. So perhaps a bit more demand. So 60% demand, 40% supply. Now, interestingly, if we take the chart on the right, which is basically what happened since the start um, of the reopening process, so in April 2020, essentially that was associated with a significant recovery in output. And there we actually see that demand has actually been a much, much more important factor driving both output clearly on the right-hand side, that's a massive um, a light blue uh, bar, but also in the case of supplier delivery times. So essentially, the, one of the reasons why those supplier delivery times are slower is because demand is coming back. So it's basically also helping to clog, not to, to tighten you know, that market. So it's not just supply, it's supply and demand. So next slide, please. So just for reassurance, we kind of take another approach. So basically, we look at a variety of indicators also coming, some of them from the PMI reports. Um, and this is basically for the US. But what we do is uh, basically a principal component analysis. So we extract the, the first and the second principal components. That is, you know, the, the common factors, the factors that are common to this data set, the data, the data that, that we have at the bottom. And the chart on the left tells us basically how the first principal component looks like. And this looks pretty much like the business cycle. So you can see the global financial crisis recession there, the recovery. You have the slowdown of 2015-16, the recovery thereafter. And of course, the pandemic crisis, the pandemic recession, and then a significant acceleration in demand to the point where basically we're at the highest, you know, at the strongest point, you know, since the, since the data um, started at least since since our uh, calculation started in 2000, 2001. On the right hand side, we have the second principal component, which we associate with supply. And you can see also there that we are at a high point in 2021, as we, one would expect because of you know the supply disruptions. It's not off the charts as the one on the left. Uh, I would say it's more you know akin to what we saw in 2000 and and 9, 10, which was basically the recovery process um, associated with you know, the exit of the global financial crisis. But we cannot deny that there's a supply element there. Next slide, please. And this is just to show you, you know, if you combine uh, the, the demand elements that we calculated both with our econometric analysis and with our principal component analysis on the left, and the supply elements on the right, essentially, they kind of look the same. So to us, that gives us reassurance that you know, we are kind of looking at a similar type of phenomenon. And the bottom line is that basically, we have a combination of both. We have you know, part of the story being you know, supply clearly you know, being disrupted you know, as part of the COVID process, but also demand coming back and coming back you know, quite aggressively, especially in the US. So next slide, please. So here, let's let's go into what um, what is actually going on, and and I think we need to understand, you know, the, the COVID crisis and how it has, you know, affected, you know, the the demand patterns um, that affect, you know, the supply chains. So essentially, what we saw in the US, and you know, we have similar story in Europe as well is a substitution of services that happened during lockdowns to durable consumption. So essentially, lockdowns led to this big shift from consumption services to durables. And, and the example that I give is that, you know, basically all of us have been, you know, producing and consuming at home what we were used to produce and consume outside. So we were buying gym equipment or TVs instead of going to the gym or the cinemas. And of course, that you know those purchases, especially in the U.S., were facilitated 
by a very aggressive you know, fiscal stimulus program, which was you know, basically the checks that were put in the pockets of, of the American public. Next slide, please. So that's basically the story on manufacturing. Let me move on now to, uh, to the labor market. Or perhaps before I move on, are there, are there any questions about the, the manufacturing side of things? Or any observations that people want to make? Yeah. Okay, please go ahead. Uh, I, don't know. I don't know if you can see me, but maybe you can hear me, uh, Tim van der Eiken. I can see you and I can hear you, so okay. perfect. Thank you for your uh, comments on this. Uh, what I miss is the disruption of the supply chains in this uh, story. Uh, I think this also has to do with uh, the shortages in the supply side. But uh, how, how do you look at that? And also the relocalization of, uh, of industries and production. Yeah. yeah. No, so, so let, don't, don't get me wrong. So the, the disruption in supply is there. And, uh, you know, it's... You know, there I have various indicators that tell tell me that. So the, actually, slide four. So if, if you can go back to slide four, you know, this is definitely telling me that there is supply disruptions, uh, and this is evident in say, you know, the PMI reports and also in the you know in in the inflation data. Now, what I was trying to do is to say, okay, is this just truly supply, or is it also demand? And how much, um, how much of each um, do we have? And, and, it's, and the answer is that we have a bit of both. And in the recovery, demand has been actually quite, uh, quite strong, especially in the US. Now, I'm not denying that there's still supply issues. And I would love to discuss what Omicron, for example, you know, means for, for all of this. And, uh, and on your question about um, relocation of, um, of production, I, I think I think that's that's going that's happening and that's going to to happen in a more evident way in the sense that corporates will try to react to basically according to to regional proximity to be as close as possible to the sources of demand for the products and I can see for example you know Mexico playing a big role there you know, providing manufactured goods to the U.S., you know, Central and Eastern Europe, you know, providing goods, uh, manufactured goods for Europe, for Western Europe. And of course, you know, Asia, both North and, and, and South, providing goods, you know, to, to China, which are, you know, these, these are the three largest, you know, markets in the world, right? And um, consumer markets in the world. So that, but the evidence of that is really hard to see in data. So it's more, you know, what you gather from talking to CEOs or, you know, from some, from reading the news, you know, in, um, in, in the business press. Yeah. Does, yeah. does that help? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. There's also a question in the chat um, field. Uh, yes. Guillermo. It's um, about this shift uh, that you observe uh, from services uh, to consumer durables, like uh, consumers yes. have moved from buying services to durables, um, especially in the US. Um, Peter Kranefeld says, does it indicate that US, uh, that US citizens have difficulty saving larger amounts? And I think, it, you know, because we all had the experience that we've been saving a lot, uh, uh, especially in the beginning of the COVID crisis. Exactly. And now these people can't wait to spend it. Uh, is this a U.S. phenomenon? I think maybe that's the question rather than European. Yeah, yeah that, that's an excellent question. And, I, I, and I, I regret not having that chart in this presentation. But basically, I have um, a, you know, a similar chart for various European economies as well, and actually for various developed market economies. And uh, and the answer is um, is is yes you're right I mean the the US the US consumer is you know it is really really um, you know eager to continue consuming as as they did in the past and naturally and, and even more and of course the, the crucial part of the story is that this was facilitated by a significant fiscal stimulus but that you know that that materialized itself in terms of cash handouts that wasn't really you know, evident in such a direct way in, I would say, in any other country um, in the world. So that really facilitated, you know, that uh, that boom uh, for for durables. And you're still seeing it today 
Whereas in the other, you know, economies that I've monitored, you're actually seeing a significant retracement. So in, in the chart that I see, you can also see a, you know, a bit of a retracement in the U.S., but in, in other um, countries, including European countries, the, the retracement is actually more pronounced. All right. Great. Excellent. So should we continue or are there any other questions? Continue. I think we can move on to the labor market. Okay, so in the in the case of the labor market, I will zoom into the US and I will then cover Europe because the stories um, are a bit different. So in the US, what what is really interesting is that we think the anomaly of the COVID crisis has not really been the, the decline in, in, in supply, but rather the surge in demand. And the easiest way to you know to present this is to look at the labor force participation rate on the left hand side. And compare it, you know, with what happened in the global financial crisis. So, yes, you know, labor supply hasn't come back fully. It was significantly disrupted, of course, because of the COVID crisis. But it's, you know, starting to to come back um, to levels that are, you know, roughly similar to the ones that we saw in the in the global financial crisis. You know, after you know, say, two years um, from the depth of the um, of the crisis there. But on the on the right hand side, what, can, what we can see is a gauge for demand, which is you know the job openings, and you can see here that you know it's really exploding higher in the U.S. So it's really a story of you know very aggressive you know um, hiring demand. So next next slide, please. We're also seeing some patterns in terms of wages that are more um, more common in late cycle experiences. So for example, um, what we typically see is that, you know, job switchers, so people who are changing jobs, tend to actually, you know, secure higher wages, you know, when you are quite advanced in the cycle. So you, you saw that, for example, in 2007. So that black line starts diverging from the other two. And you're starting to see that now as well. So it's, it's kind of like a, you know, like a late cycle type of, um, feature and the same thing with you know the the wages of younger workers so younger workers you know again tend to you know garner higher wages towards you know the mature part of the cycle and that's exactly what you are seeing now so it's just to say that in the us it seems like at least in the labor market we are already seeing you know some wage dynamics that are kind of similar to what you see you know in uh, in mature cycles so next slide, please. <laughs> so is, there, is there a question? There, yeah, so that late cycle, that means there will be a crash very soon. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. I mean, it, and we'll discuss that. Um, we'll discuss that. <laughs> okay. But basically, but I think what we really need to think about is, you know, what's, how much exuberance we have now in terms of demand pressure on supply and what's the new equilibrium that we're likely to converge towards. And I think the policy response will be crucial here, okay? Because typically what happens is that when you enter into late cycle, the Fed is forced to, you know, tighten policy very aggressively. And that is really what kills um, recoveries. And, uh, and the question is, will that happen again now? So we'll, we'll get there. So just, just hold on. Um, Okay, so next uh, next slide is real wages, and th this is so. This is also part of the answer to your question. So, if you look at you know real wage gains or decreases, you know in the last few few months, we're actually seeing real wages falling. So they are not really keeping up with inflation, and that it, in itself is kind of like a stopgap. It's self limiting. So it means that you know ultimately it seems like. You know, these workers have jobs, but those jobs are, you know, not really keeping up with inflation. So, so essentially your, your, real, um, your real incomes are, are hit. And that means that your consumption power is, is debilitated. So again, it's, it's a kind of a, a self-limiting mechanism that we're seeing there. Next slide, please. And let me move on to um, to to Europe. And and basically, what is interesting is that you know if if we look at you know the you know the data on job openings in in Europe, 
it's a lot less aggressive than what you're seeing in the U.S. Yes, you were seeing a nice recovery, but it's not really as explosive as, as what we saw in the U.S. Next slide, please. If you look at what's going on in terms of wages, and in particular negotiated wages in the euro area, essentially, you know, we are we're not seeing you know a significant revision up, and you know, past increases in the minimum wage have not really fed through to higher you know aggregate wages, and and uh, we think this is partly you know related to the you know the reforms that we saw since the uh, since the sovereign debt crisis, you know, which means that you know few workers are now. Um, covered by wage bargaining and unions. And next slide, please. So maybe, maybe I will post. I will post here before I move on to commodities. So are, are there any questions here? But basically, the bottom line on the on the on the labor market is that in the U.S., yes, we're seeing all this, you know, exuberance, especially on the demand side, but we're not seeing wages you know, picking up as much as inflation. And that, that's kind of act, act, acting as a limiting force. And, you know, when we discussed the outlook, you, you hit it on the, you know, in, you know, on the head when you said, okay, so that does it, does it mean that we're, you know, getting a significant boom here that will actually lead to a recession? To me, the key question is, you know, what, what sort of equilibrium do we converge towards? And in all of these markets, you know, when I look at the demand side, in manufacturing, in labor, and you will see, you know, in commodities, there are signs that were actually um, moderating. So my, my, my big story, you know, towards the end will be a story of, you know, of moderation into next year. So it's not a crash. It's just a moderation to, you know, what is, I think, a pretty healthy, you know, environment for, for the economy. So let's move on to commodities. So this is slide 15. So basically here, what I want to show is that in the case of some cyclical commodities, especially those that are directly linked to Chinese demand, we're seeing a significant um, fall in prices. So this is the case of iron ore prices, which are you know, really off the, off the highs, and the case of steel prices. I mean, of course, when we when we think about commodities, immediately we think about you know oil and copper, and we and we associate you know them with you know the significant rally that we've seen in 2021, and even before, right? So since the reopening, we have seen a recovery. We cannot deny that. But what we cannot deny either is that China is going through a significant slowdown. It's it's a serious issue, and Chinese demand, even though you know it's is less perhaps important than than it was in the past, it's still a very important driver of these commodities. And you're seeing, as I said, those linked to China directly or to or to Chinese property and construction directly, like iron ore and steel. But the question is, you know, what will happen to you know copper and oil? And we're starting to see you know signs of that also moderating in terms of you know price action. Next slide please. And of course, you know the the commodity stories have been more evident in uh, in other in other assets like energy, you know, not gas, thermal coal, um, U.S. not gas, and uh, and freight. So essentially, what we're seeing is that you know, in, especially in the case of not gas, I mean, these prices exploded higher. I don't have to explain you uh, one way what went on there. But it's just to show that you know we are we seem to be kind of off the boil, off that you know that significant squeeze, and uh, and it's not to, it's not to say that this is going to get resolved you know very easily, but it's just to show that you know there are signs that some of these markets are starting to unclog, and I think that the the freight market, so this is the basically the, the PDI, so the Baltic Dry um, Index. Is also showing, you know, a bit of a reversal, meaning that essentially, you know, vessels and port congestion is also starting to ease. Next slide, please. So le let me talk a little bit about the, the oil market because I think the oil market, first, is very important, and second, I think it, it kind of summarizes, um, you know, some of the trends that we're likely to see into 2022 that I think the market is generally not really kind of believing or aware of. So essentially, we expect a gradual rebalancing of supply and demand um, from deficits 
So here, you know, in the chart on the left, you see, you know, the deficit that we had at the um, at the beginning of 2022, or sorry, well, how we're ending 2022, and then how we think this evolves, you know, in the first half of the year, next year, and then in the second half of the year, next year. And essentially, we think that we're going to end with a little surplus here in, in, the, in the old market. And that should actually facilitate um, prices, you know, to move lower. We expect $70 per barrel in the first half of the year and $60 per barrel in the second half of next year. And the key story here is a bit of demand, a bit of supply. So on the demand side, we expect lower, um, lower demand. And, uh, and you can see that, you know, basically in, in these two kind of minus ones that I'm highlighting here on the, on the demand side. And on the, in the case of supply, essentially what we're expecting is that OPEC plus uh, should be the main source of supply. Actually, we saw um, a few days ago that OPEC actually continued to, you know, to pump uh, or continue to their plan of pumping um, 400,000 uh, uh, barrels um, a day um, into next year, which is, you know, um, of course, you know, adding to supply. And what is really perhaps notable this time around is that the the shell producers in the U.S., which we also you know call the independent U.S. producers, they are not really coming back with a lot of supply. So that's because basically they are concentrating their efforts into you know paying shareholders uh, cash, so giving dividends to shareholders rather than reinvesting in production. So basically, as we expect a softer oil market, and I can tell you in copper. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we get a bit of that as well. So I know that there's ESG issues, you know, later on and electrification and electric vehicles and all that. But short term, we have a supply pipeline that was there already because of investment in previous, you know, in the previous cycle. And that supply is going to come through. And, uh, and that means that, you know, the supply demand balance for next year and for 2023 would actually shift from a deficit into a surplus. So again, is is to temper a bit the expectations of commodity prices, you know, going off the roof here. So let me put it all together and hopefully we can have a nice discussion um, afterwards. So essentially what I think we're seeing is a transition from what is a demand boom that of course has hit um, supply disruptions, and it's leading to all sorts of complications. So, you know, shortages in various markets and inflation in various markets as well, especially in the goods market. I would say we go into a more moderate environment into next year, a more moderate environment in terms of demand, especially in the U.S. And that means that the shortages problem should be easier to fix. Essentially, if you have less demand, you don't have, you know, those excessive, you know, price spikes that we're seeing in all of these markets. It should be more manageable. Now, on the manufacturing side, essentially, we find evidence that, you know, this, the, the demand recovery has been a big driver, not just supply. And we confirm that, you know, in various, you know, bits of our, of our analysis. In the case of labor, essentially, the, this, despite you know these unprecedented dislocations, we don't think the labor market is actually going to be a big driver of inflation going forward. And as I said, in the case of commodities, what we're seeing is yes, you know, high prices because of you know those you know th that demand that initially from China and then from the rest of the world, um, but we expect that demand to moderate, partly because of the China slowdown, but also because of the US slowdown. So a, a, big, a big part of our moderation story is essentially that policy stimulus, and especially the fiscal side, is going to roll over in the US. As I said, real wages or real earnings are not really increasing. They are not really keeping up with inflation. And that should also temper a bit the demand side. And at some point, you know, the U.S. consumer in particular um, will have enough durable goods, you know, in, 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 their, in their homes. So there is a limit to how much, you know, how many laptops you can buy or how many cars you can buy or how many 
um, you know, gym equipment or, you know, or, or washing machines you can buy. And, uh, and I think all of that should actually lead us to um, a more moderate demand environment, you know, and a, and a growth rate, you know, that is still healthy, but, uh, but clearly not as exuberant as, as what we're seeing just now. Now, I, I just want to make a couple of, uh, going, back to, going back to the first, uh, the first slide that I showed, so the kind of the motivation slide, if we can go back to that one, please. Sorry, can, can we go back to my, my first slide? Number one. Yeah, so the, so the one, uh, it's, it's actually the second one where I have the, where I'm motivated to talk with, you know, it's, sorry, slide number three. Yeah, this one here. So I, I just want to make a point. So more, more moderate inflation in, in our view, essentially means that the Fed doesn't really necessarily have to um, have to ramp up the tightening. The market is already pricing in, you know, quite significant tightening. So something like 150, you know, basis points of hikes by the end of 2023. We think that's, you know, probably more than what they actually are going to deliver. And, and basically for the duration call, that means that we, we think we've seen already the peak in yields, both at the 10-year point and actually at the front end. And I know that's an, another consensus call. But when we look at, at the dynamics of the curve, we think basically the US economy cannot tolerate very, very high interest rates. And by very high, I, I mean, I, they cannot tolerate, you know, you know, even uh, even a move of you know 150 basis points, the, the back end just cracks, tell, telling us that the U.S. economy um, is very very sensitive to that, and that also means that you know if the Fed is patient and we have this more moderate growth environment and more moderate inflation, essentially restaking can can be a good proposition. You can be you know seeing tighter spreads and higher you know risky asset valuations. Of course, it's going to be choppy because we're in the middle of the reassessment, but that choppiness, that volatility should offer opportunities, and we are happy to take the long side of those opportunities. So I will pause here. I don't know how much time we have for questions and for, for debate, but, um, but that's all I wanted to say. Okay. Thank you very much, Guillermo. We have about uh, seven minutes for questions and uh, debate. So I'll open up uh, to the audience uh, here. And is there anything, anybody wants a question? I have a question here. I have one uh, myself actually as um, you know, basically you say this is temporary and um, that is the assumption that central banks are also working on. Um, well, not but, so much the Fed now. <laughs> well, but, yeah, yeah. But, but what if you're, uh, what, what signs should we be looking for? Uh, you know, like if you could be wrong, you know, like we might have higher inflation or even runaway inflation at something. So. Yeah. What are the signals we should be looking for? What could co happen so that we still do get very high inflation? Yeah. For that, that's periods? an excellent question, and uh, and and, uh, and I will I will address it uh, just now. So so to me, COVID control is really really important, and I was going to you know even challenge challenge you to challenge me <laughs> because you know Omicron could be a risk, but. Essentially, what I think is a is really, really a helpful development is vaccinations and booster shots. So, to the extent that we have that we have a protected uh, consumer, essentially unprotected, you know, um, you know, corporates through vaccinations, we can start to normalize, and that normalization implies a recovery in, in services, but also, you know, basically a return to or away from that excessive, you know, consumption on the durable side. I think, you know, that 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 confidence is is really helpful for, you know, exiting, you know, these uh, these supply shortages. And then the so so that so that's one part. No, so you know, just that vaccinations help to sort out the problem in terms of gauging, you know, basically the supply disruptions and, you know, the pressure of the, of the manual supply, I think we need to monitor, you know, all the indicators that I have mentioned before. So we need to monitor, 
what's happening in the labor shortages. We need to monitor what's happening, you know, in shipping, you know, in freight and in, you know, the number of vessels that are stuck in ports. We need to monitor crucially, you know, how, um, how Asia, you know, is responding in terms of, you know, their, their, the production of manufactured goods. Um, are, are, are the, you know, are the restrictions that we're likely to see in place because of Omicron um, really a big disruption? Um, you know, that we, we basically need to monitor this day in, day out. Um, so I also have as part of, you know, this work kind of like a, um, if, if you want a heat map in terms of, you know, all these various indicators. And, um, and you know, what, what I was trying to, to show is that we're off the boil. So if we were flashing red a couple of months ago, we're now more in yellow territory, which is kind of helpful. Yeah. But we might flash red again soon. You know, like it's the same with COVID. Sometimes it seems like it's gone and might return. Well, it depends. So I, again, I have I have a chart that I only got ready yesterday, so unfortunately I couldn't show it. But but basically, what it shows is that as as the the pandemic has progressed, essentially the sensitivity of growth of GDP, for example, to new restrictions is less and less. So it basically means that, you know, we're learning to live with this virus and vaccinations are a huge part of that. No vaccinations and, you know, learning to live with it. I mean, some of you guys are there live. This wouldn't have happened six months ago or a year ago, for sure. And we're in the middle of an Omicron crisis. Okay. Right? I have a question here um, online. Um, Second, it's about um, the view that uh, some people have that we might be in for structurally higher inflation because of other reasons, namely yeah. um, deglobalization. Uh, um, like you see the pressures with uh, China and Russia um, and uh, the move uh, away from fossil fuels into greener uh, for source, source of energy, which might also be more yeah. expensive in the beginning. So uh, yeah. what's your view on those factors? You know? Yeah. Again, another excellent question. So, so to me, I would distinguish between the, you know, if you want the medium, the short to medium term, which is the next few months and say next year, and then the long term, which is, you know, three years out, five years out. I think three to five years out, these issues are going to be genuine issues, constraining supply. So deglobalization, I think, is for real. Um, we're seeing, you know, various governments that are more inward looking. Um, we're seeing already, you know, uh, you know, decreasing global trade and decreasing um, in the volumes of, of, of trade and, you know, FDI, for example. So there, there's evidence of that. And that means basically that, you know, we should face, you know, potentially a, a more inflationary world. Um, the other the other point is ESG. I mean, ESG is also a, a you know a significant you know um, issue when it comes to constraining supply as we know it today, because we'll have to essentially transform in mainly the, the energy that we use to produce you know goods, um, and and that and that will imply you know again limiting supply at least for some time. So. Yes, uh, I, I, per, I can perfectly see, you know, those inflationary pressures longer term. Shorter term, though, um, I'm not so convinced um, because of the reasons um, that I mentioned uh, today. So there's cyclical elements there at play as well. Okay, I think. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have time for perhaps one more question. I see very satisfied faces in the in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody is. Um, has um, learned everything that they need to know about inflation for now. So thank you very much, uh, Guillermo. Um, no, thank you. If I may, <laughs> I, I, will, I okay. will just add one point to what I said about the, the longer sure. term. One force that we shouldn't underestimate, which I think is, you know, disinflationary, even, you know, medium to long term, is innovation. I will mention two actually that are disinflationary because I, I you know, I, I agree with the supply issues from deglobalization and ESG, but innovation um, is, you know, is is still a significant deflationary force. 
And the pandemic has actually unleashed, unlocked part of that in terms of you know, teleworking, in terms of the globalization of, of services. And the second one is you know, high levels of debt. And that, that also con- that, that constrains growth, that limits, that makes the economies in general more sensitive to higher interest rates and, and more deflationary in nature. And again, the pandemic has only exacerbated that problem. So again, you know, even though we can make the inflationary case, I wouldn't lose sight of these disinflationary forces. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much.